Hello Magic Makers, welcome to Storytime with Mombirilla. This is a young adult fiction and may be inappropriate for some younger viewers. Evil Thing A Tale of That DeVille Woman By Serena Valentino Copyright Disney Enterprises Incorporated 2020 Dedicated with love to my dog, Gozer Chapter 1 Part 1 Cruella DeVille I suppose I should start my story here, in Hell Hall, where all my marvelous plans were born from the darkness. But I'd rather start from the beginning, or at least close enough to give you an idea of what makes me tick. Sure, you know the story of those puppies, those wretched Dalmatians, and their insipid owners, Roger and Anita. And I'm sure you even rooted for them to evade me. Me, that monster... The devil woman in a fur coat. But don't I deserve a chance to tell my own side of the story? The real story. It is fabulous, after all. Behold the story of me, Cruella de Vil. Tick-tock, darlings. We're going back in time. To when I was a young girl of eleven, living in my family's mansion. So prepare yourselves, dears. You're in for a wild ride. My mamma. Papa and I lived in a grand house on Belgrave Square. It was large, lurid, and magnificent. An imposing home with four massive columns supporting a terrace that looked down on the square. Our community was tucked safely away from the common London rabble on the other side. We were on the proper side, perhaps by many sprawling parks, creating a world that seemed to belong to us alone. Of course, one could see the occasional servant polishing the brass on the front porches, or a nanny strolling in the park with her squealing charge, and there were the old women who sold violets on corners, and the little boys who sold the papers and delivered messages, but they were almost invisible, like wraiths. I hardly thought of them as people. I called them non-people. To me, they almost seemed like ghosts, while, of course, my own servants were very much alive. Most of them were like silent specters, popping in and out of view, only when we needed them. They weren't real. Or didn't seem so to me, anyway. Not like Mamma and Papa. Not like me. Some of my servants seemed more real to me than others, the ones who were always in my view. The servants who weren't quite servants, but something in between a servant and a member of my family. We shall get to them in good time. But, oh, how I loved my Mamma and Papa. And our grand house in Belgrave, with its crystal chandeliers, lavish wallpapers, and shining wood floors covered in exotic rugs. And in a way, I even loved our ghost-like servants moving silently and systematically through the house, taking care of our every whim, always there, always ready to do my bidding, at the sound of a tinkling bell. The image of our grand house shines in my memory like a light, desperately trying to lead me back home again. If only I could stand within the safety of its walls once more. To live my days as gloriously as I did when I was a child. When everything was simple. There were so many splendid days in that house. They spin around in my memory, sometimes making me dizzy with homesickness. I spent most of my days with Miss Prickett, my governess, in the schoolroom. Miss Prickett had steered my education since I was old enough to learn how to read. She gave me lessons in French watercolor painting, needlepoint reading, and writing. Most girls in our social circle got their educations from their governesses. Had I been a boy, I would have been sent off to boarding school, where I would have learned all manner of subjects such as Greek mythology, history, and mathematics. Girls were expected to learn how to conduct themselves in a morning room, how to behave like proper young ladies, how to host splendid parties, plan menus, and direct conversations at dinner. And that, too, was part of the education I received from Miss Prickett. But she never said no if I expressed an interest in a subject that wasn't reserved for young ladies. She encouraged my zeal for geography, for example, and let me devote as much time as I wanted to learning about the cultures and customs of different countries, because she knew I desperately wanted to travel the world when I was old enough to take such an adventure. I have such fond memories of those days. But my favorite part of each day was when I would go down to the morning room with Miss Prickett to spend a blissful hour with my mamma. One hour every day, entirely devoted to me. 
My mother's passion for exquisite clothes was unwavering. She was always beautifully dressed in the latest designs. No one could hold a candle to her, not even me. And you all know how stunning I am, don't you, dears? You've seen my photos in the papers. You know my exploits and my relentless devotion to fashion. Well, my dears, my mamma was the same. She had an exciting, glamorous life, and she deserved it. She was the most beautiful and beguiling woman I ever met. She was a true lady. She didn't have to make time for me, as busy as she was, but she did. At the same time each day, right after my lessons with Miss Prickett, I would hold the image of my mamma in my mind as I headed down our grand staircase, making my way from the schoolroom to the morning room. I had to will myself not to run down the stairs, to be a proper young lady and not squeal with delight because I was so excited to see my mamma. After all, my schoolroom was a new development. It had been recently converted from the nursery, which meant I was on my way to becoming a young lady. Miss Prickett was always there, holding my hand to make sure I behaved properly. Not that I needed her guidance in how to behave, though I did need her guidance in how to dress, as I had not yet developed Mama's ingenious skill for putting together an ensemble. Before we left the schoolroom each day to be presented to Mama, Miss Prickett made sure I was fastidiously put together. I insisted on nothing less than perfection. Miss Prickett would list everything off in succession as she inspected me, checking to see if my hair, dress, and bows were all in proper order, knowing I would be mortified if my mother noticed anything out of place. I wouldn't dream of going down in the morning room without first changing into one of my prettier dresses, or before making sure my hair was in perfect ringlets. The morning room was the room Mama preferred. It was her domain, and decorated exquisitely. It wasn't the largest room in the house, as one of the rooms on the main floor reserved for my family. It was smaller, but cozier, and one of the most beautiful. The far wall was lined with windows, along with a set of French doors that led to the terrace, which looked down on Belgrave Square. In front of the windows was a large wooden desk where my mother did her correspondences, and dealt with the daily runnings of the house. On the right-hand wall was the fireplace. The mantel was tastefully decorated with the precious treasures my parents had collected during their various travels around the globe. A pair of lovely jade tiger statues, a small golden clock, and a black onk statue of Anubis, the Egyptian god, and protector of ancient tombs. Anubis took the shape of a dog, and I always fancied he was a protector of dogs, until my father set me straight. And of course on the mantel were the invitation cards to dinners and parties that adorned the mantles of all the more fashionable households. Mama always had at least three invitations there, on any given week. Painted above the fireplace was a large semicircular art deco design that has been branded into my memory. When I close my eyes and think of the Belgravia house, I think of that design. I only wish I could describe it more accurately, because it's not the design I'm trying to describe as much as the feeling it evokes when I think of it. A sense of home. How does one describe that? The feeling of home. On the far right side of the fireplace was a set of bookshelves flanked by two large potted palms, and a distance before them was a rolling tray with various decanters containing spirits, cocktail glasses, and a canister for dispensing seltzer water. Before the fireplace was a leather couch, and opposite were two leather chairs, with a small round table between them. The walls were painted a dusty plum, and decorated with oil paintings in ornate golden frames, portraits of austere ladies and gentlemen. They were likely relatives of my father's whose names had been lost to us. Almost every visit to the morning room to see my mother was the same, but it took my breath away each time. I saw her sitting on the leather couch, waiting for me. She was so striking, my mamma. Whatever her plans were after our visit in the morning room would determine how she was dressed. Usually it was an afternoon out, with friends for tea and shopping. In one of my memories, she wears a lovely tea-length dress, with a low sash around her hips. As was the fashion then, her lipstick is a dusty rose cover to match her dress, a striking contrast to her long, shining black hair which she wore bundled up to look like a bob. In the evenings, when she would go out, she would wear red lipstick, but never in the daytime. Red lipstick is for evenings, she would always say. 
Sometimes I still hear her advice echoing in my mind. And when I do, I feel as though I am still a little girl. One particular afternoon stands out in my mind. To be honest, I can't say if this memory is of the one day or of many. All jumbled up together in my mind. Still, it shines brightly. My mother was sitting casually on the brown leather couch that was draped with a lavish red throw. I wanted to run into her arms the moment I saw her. But Miss Prickett squeezed my hand, a gentle reminder to act like a young lady. Instead, I stood patiently, waiting for her to divert her attention from the stacks of letters and cards she was going through. When she finally looked up at me, I smiled my most charming smile. "'Good afternoon, Cruella, my dear,' she said, putting her cheek out for me to kiss it. "'I see you're wearing that red dress again.' I was mortified. Mamma looked disappointed at me, and it made my stomach drop. "'I thought you liked this dress, Mamma. You said so just the other day. You said it made me look pretty.' My mother sighed and put down the letters she was going through. "'That is my point, dear. I just saw you wearing it a few short days ago, yet you insist on wearing it again, when I know your closet is bursting with new dresses. A lady is never seen wearing the same dress twice, Cruella. I was livid with Miss Prickett. How could she let this happen? How could she let me wear the same dress twice? Miss Prickett, would you mind ringing for tea? Then please, the both of you, do sit down. You're making me nervous, hovering above me like a couple of birds. Of course, your ladyship. Miss Prickett pulled the cord hanging to the left of the fireplace mantel, then sat down in one of the leather chairs across from the couch where Mamma and I usually sat. While we waited for our tea, Mamma would always ask me the same questions, in the same succession. Every single time, she never missed a beat, my Mamma. Are you minding, Miss Prickett, my dear? Oh, yes, Mamma. Good girl. And are you doing well with your lessons? Yes, Mamma, very well. Right now I'm learning a book about a brave young princess who can talk to trees. Stuff and nonsense. Talk to trees indeed. Miss Prickett, what's this fodderall you're having my daughter read? It's one of Cruella's adventure stories, my lady, from the book Lord Deville gave her. Ah, oh, yes, well, I won't have her ruining her eyes reading in the late hours. No, my lady, I read the stories to her in the evenings. Very well, then. Oh, look, Jackson is here with the tea. And so he was, closely followed by Jean and Pauline, two young maids in black uniforms with white hats and aprons. I could always tell what time of day it was based on the color of the maids' uniforms. Mornings and early afternoons, they were in pink, and late afternoons and evenings, they wore black. Jackson had a tray with the teapot, teacups, saucers, little plates, sugar and cream. It was my favorite tea service, the one with the tiny red roses. Jean had sandwiches, scones, and little white cakes with pretty pink flowers on them. Everything placed artfully on a standing tray with multiple tears that she set beside Mamma. Pauline, whom my Mamma called Polly, had a grand raspberry jelly sitting prettily on a silver plate. It jiggled as she set it upon the table. And what is this, Polly? Mamma asked. A special treat from Mrs. Bailey. Polly gave me a sly grin as she answered my Mamma. Yes, my lady, made especially for Miss Cruella. Well, you better go down to the kitchen and thank Mrs. Bailey. After we've had our tea, Cruella, that was very thoughtful of her to send you a jelly. Though next time, Polly, have her send it to the nursery. I don't want sticky sweets in the morning room. It's the schoolroom now, Mamma, I said quietly. What's that, dear? Speak up. I won't have you acting the timid mouse, she said, eyeing the jelly like it might leap off the table and ruin the fine rug at any moment. It's the schoolroom now, not the nursery, I said, raising my voice a bit. Yes, of course, dear. But that detail's hardly worth you interrupting me. Now, you shouldn't keep Mrs. Bailey waiting. Are you almost finished with your tea? Miss Prickett took my plate, piled with little sandwiches and tea cakes, with one hand, and took my teacup by the saucer with the other, then placed them on the silver tray. Jean will take these down to the kitchen for you, won't you, Jean? So Miss Cruella can finish them there. That's a lovely idea, Miss Prickett. Don't you think, Cruella? I have to dash out anyway, my dear. I shouldn't be late to meet Lady Splatton. If I am, she'll speak of nothing else until something else diverts her attention. Mamma then turned to our butler. Jackson, my coat. Yes, your ladyship. And out he went, with Jean and Pauline following him from the morning room, with all the tea things. Give your mamma a kiss before she goes, Miss Greather, Miss Prickett said, as if I needed coaxing. 
but the fact was I was taking my time. I wanted to see Mamma in her fur coat. You can follow me to the vestibule, if you like, Cruella, and see me off before you head down to the kitchen. Miss Prickett took my hand and walked out of the morning room into the vestibule, the main entryway. It was the grand nexus of our home. One could say it was the heart of the house. In the centre of the room was a round table with a vase of flowers that were changed daily. My father often put his head on that table when he walked in the door. It would, of course, be spirited away by his man to be cleaned before it would be returned to his room, where he would find it the next day. To the right of the main entryway was our exquisite dining room, and to the left was the grand staircase that led upstairs to a sitting room and a ballroom, and further up still was the floor with our bedrooms. One more flight up were the servants' quarters, tucked away in the attic. At the foot of the grand staircase was the doorway that led down to the basement, where you could find the kitchen and where the servants worked, and right across from the front doors, was the morning room, the soul of the house. Jackson and Jean were standing near the front door, waiting for us. Jackson held my mamma's fur coat, and Jean held my mother's handbag, which glittered in the early evening light. After Jackson helped my mother on with her coat, she patted me on the head. Now be a good girl, Cruella, and don't gorge yourself on sweets, no matter how forcefully Mrs. Bradley insists. Goodbye, my darling. I won't be home for dinner. She blew me a kiss and dashed out of the door, her long fur coat trailing behind her dramatically. My mother was always off to meet her friends, sometimes not returning home until the early evening. And if father was away, or late at the House of Lords, sometimes she wouldn't come home until well after dinner, when I was already in bed. Most days were like this. Oh, but how I loved my special time with Mamma. An hour a day, every day, for as long as I could remember. An hour devoted entirely to me. It was the highlight of my day, a memory I hold on to now in the darkness. My time with Mamma. Beautiful Mamma, in her fur coats, glittering jewelry and fancy frocks. Beautiful Mamma dashing off to exciting locations. She was tall, thin, and lanky, with striking black hair and eyes so dark brown that they too almost looked black. She had high cheekbones with angular features any model or actress would die for. She was always dripping with diamonds and draped in glittering dresses and, of course, her fur coats. I can see her now when I close my eyes, shining in the darkness like a shimmering star. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this reading. If you haven't had a chance to... Please take a second, like, subscribe, ring that notification bell, comment down below, share with a friend, and check out some of the other villain series chapters and books as well. Join us next time, and remember, let it go and keep moving forward. Have a magical day. Bye!